is controversial and charismatic. Dr. Charlie Teo is one of the best neurosurgeons in the world, but he sometimes upsets his colleagues by taking on cases they say are inoperable. I've invited him in to paint his portrait and to have a look inside him and to have a look inside his fascinating brain. Well, I hope Alan catches the essence of who I am and, and, you know, I'm really not a bad bloke. I know people have said some pretty nasty things about me and I've got a, a reputation of being a bit of a cowboy, but, you know, I'm not. All I am is a simple sort of guy with simple needs. I admire and respect Dr Teo so much, you know, and I, I really want him to like the painting. He's got such an intense job operating on brain tumours and I hope I can capture what that pressure means to him. To do that, I really need to get to know the man, get to know the man some call a maverick. The portrait is his to keep and he won't see it until the end of today. So, yeah, a little bit nervous. Charlie? Lovely to meet you. Nice to meet you too. Yeah, yeah. Thanks for coming on. That's a pleasure. Yeah, I've been practicing um, drawing your your face, and um, I remember one of my one of my mates said to me, "You look a little bit like that Dr. Charlie Teo, Arn, but not as good looking." <laughs> so my mate, that's what my mate said to me. Yeah, no, he's a sensible guy. I'd like to meet. <laughs> look, Arn, I, I have to I have to be uh, honest with you. I had no idea that you're such an accomplished artist, but these portraits are magnificent. Thank you very much. That's one of my dad. That's your dad? Yeah, I painted him for the Archibald. Did you win? No, I didn't win. It was like runner-up people's choice. <laughs> but it's interesting that you go, bang, did you win? You, you like winning? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, shit, yeah. No, I'm very competitive. Competitive in a good way, though, because uh, I expect a lot of myself. Competitive in a bad way, because I, I expect a lot of people around me as well. In fact, that's one of my major criticisms of that people have made about me that I, I expect so much of others. But, uh, yeah, no, I like to win. So Dad was a doctor too, wasn't he? He was a doctor. Uh, unfortunately, he suffered from those sort of being very uh, dedicated to his work. So we didn't see him that much. And whenever I did see him, it was mostly for disciplinary reasons and he was always, I was always getting into trouble for some reason. Really? Uh, was he tough? He was tough. I remember once he hit me with the samurai sword. And, uh, yeah. <laughs> you, you hopefully sheathed. It wasn't sheathed, actually. It was the flat part of it, and, but it was enough to cut my bottom. Oh. And my poor old mum had to sort of stitch me up. And, oh. uh, yeah, it was really tough love in those days. You have a lot of love and admiration for your mum. Mm. Um, she was a major force in my life because my dad was a little bit of a dropkick and he wasn't around much and he wasn't the nicest person in the world. And I guess if you have to be grounded, you need at least one parent who sort of loves you and unconditionally is there for you all the time. That was my mum, yeah. Charlie Teo grew up in Picnic Point in southwestern Sydney, in southwestern Sydney. But he went to school at the exclusive Scots College in the eastern suburbs. Growing up different wasn't always easy. Did you experience much racism? Yeah. You know, people ask me that all the time and I don't, I don't sort of like focusing on it because it wasn't such a negative thing. It, I think it made me a little bit of who I am today. Mm. And the racism was, I mean, it was bad. It was bad because there weren't that many Chinese people around. Uh, there was only three of us at Scott's at the time. It wasn't a day that I went out as a child that I wasn't jeered or mocked for being Chinese. Do you remember any uh, instances in particular that stand out? There was that one time I remember where I realised how strong my sister was because I was sitting in the car, mum had gone into Bankstown Square to do some shopping. These kids came around and I was really fearful because they were a big bunch of guys and they started, they spotted us in the car and started just yelling abuse at us for being yellow and go back home and all that kind of stuff. And I remember saying to my sister, look, let's just close the windows and duck down behind the seats and just hide from these, uh, these guys. And she did exactly the opposite. She opened the windows and she started abusing them and like a little, <laughs> like a little uh, yappy dog, and <laughs> like that. <laughs> and I thought, shit. Wow. You know, she's the brave one. I'm, I'm the coward. When you were 12, your parents divorced. 
Yes, it was a very acrimonious divorce. Uh, not the nicest sort of situation for a young kid to find himself in, but uh, it was pretty nasty. But thankfully, my father had never been much of a father anyway. Put it this way, there wasn't too much bad in it. Uh, it was not a good relationship. The two were fighting all the time. He wasn't that too much of a father to me. So, in fact, I saw nothing but positives when he left. And did you not see him for a while after that? Yeah, no, it became so acrimonious that... Uh, uh, he assaulted me once in a in a uh, dentist's waiting room because he wanted me to meet his family or something who were out from Singapore at the time and I didn't want to go, so he beat the crap out of me. How old were you? Uh, I was at boarding school, so I must have been over nine but under 12, say. Mm. Uh, but, but old enough to stand up for myself and go, look, I don't want to go with you. Anyway, so he, uh, my mum put out a straining order against him and you can imagine that the whole thing became so terrible after that, I just didn't have a bar of him mm. until, until a few years before he died. And what made you, um, when, when you saw him again? What... I don't know, I just realised that there's always two sides to every story. Not that I'm defending him for beating a child up, but uh, I think it takes more energy and more emotional uh, energy to hate someone than to love someone or forgive someone. Are you glad you did it though? For, but you yeah. know, what you said was very interesting. Sometimes it takes more energy to hate someone than to love and forgive them. Yeah, I have no regrets about getting back and making amends. And in fact, I think I would have had regrets if I hadn't done it. Yeah. When you went to boarding school, you, um, you play the bagpipes. Yeah, have my... you always been different? Yeah, I know. Weird, eh? <laughs> it's great. We were fortunate enough to be invited to the Edinburgh Military Tattoo back in 1973, uh, I think it was. From Sydney, Australia, we present the Scots College Pipes and Drum. And we're the first Australian schoolboy band mm -hmm. to ever play in the Royal Edinburgh Military Tattoo. And I was the first Chinese schoolboy ever to play in the Royal Military Tattoo. So uh, Newsweek did an article on me and uh, that's, how, that's how different it was, that a Chinese-Australian schoolboy should be playing the bagpipes. And they put it on, the, they put it on TV, did that? Was Newsweek TV? No, nah, Newsweek was a magazine. magazine. You're too young. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You've had lots of different jobs, haven't you? Again, my mum, she felt that to give me a balanced uh, education, I should know what... You know, the masses do. I, in other words, I was going to a nice school, but just because I go to a nice school doesn't mean I can't appreciate uh, the hard work that people have to do to make, make the world go round. So she made me do the milk run when I was a kid. Then I had to work as a bowser boy, uh, a barman, a waiter, bouncer. You were a bouncer? A bouncer, yeah. <laughs> what, uh, what, what, like, big guy at the door sort of stuff. Big guy at the door, I did that for six years. Yeah, I earned more money as a bouncer than I did as a doctor for the first <laughs> few years, yeah. And do, because you're also a black belt in karate. I did, I got my black belt. Uh, but, you know, getting your black belt doesn't really make you a fighter or a street fighter. So I then learnt a few other styles, like I did some boxing, some Jeet Kune Do, some Shotokan, Budokan. I remember I was a bouncer at some of the balls at New South Wales University. One time I took on about 16, 20 guys in the back lane who were trying to break into the ball and I, I managed to, yeah... Hold my own. Wow. <laughs> so, yeah, no, I was good. I was yeah. fast, I was aggressive. I had good psychology as well because if you take on a big group of guys, you've got to make sure you hit the guy with the biggest mouth and the guy who's sort of leading the pack. And if you can sort of floor him and overcome him, then the other sort of become scared and back off and then it's just easy picking after that. Is that right? Yeah, so I identified the, the ringleader. Yep. I just absolutely gunned him. And, uh, yeah, so, and then I go, right, who's next? And then, and then they all sort of back off. I can't fight, but I just go, who's next? Yeah. <laughs> I read in your book that Bruce Lee might have been one of your role models. Yeah, no, Bruce Lee wasn't so much a role model because he seemed like a bit of a, I don't know, he seemed like a bit of a show-off, Bruce Lee. Well, not that I'm not a show-off, but anyway, he demonstrated to me the level of excellence that you can achieve through hard work and tenacity, mm. and that's what I loved about him. He was this little fella, he was picked on, and he just basically uh, trained and trained and trained and disciplined himself to the stage where he got to be the best in, you know, the, best in the world. You like Bruce Lee, and, and so you get a black belt in karate. Yeah. I like Bruce Lee, I stand in front of the mirror doing that. 
<laughs> that's all I. That's the difference between you and me, Charlie. Um, I'm just going to do a little bit here. Yeah. And then we'll get back on all right? This is oh, coming great. together. It's coming together. That's not a brush. That's not a paintbrush. Yeah, I use um, I use these um, cake decorating knives. I've had a lot of jobs. I worked as a cake decorator for a lot of years. Okay. And so now I, I prefer them. I feel like, you know. But I use brushes as well. I use both. There's something very, very uh, unique about those paintings. You see, what you've got in these paintings, you, you've got people's personality in the paintings, I think. Thank you. I mean, they look like they're alive. So the difference between my job and yours is I can make loads of mistakes and I just paint over them. <laughs> just paint over them, yeah. <laughs> well, they say doctors can bury their mistakes. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I shouldn't laugh. <laughs> That's a joke. I wasn't expecting Charlie to have such a good sense of humour. There's an air of coolness about him, but of course he's experienced a lot of sadness too. I think what he does for his patients is amazing, and I want to get some of his determination into this portrait. Mm -hmm. 